my talk is uh, really to get you uh, to hit the ground running um, using mostly the blue gene, but I will talk a little bit about other uh, resources at um, ALCF. And if you uh, had the opportunity to work on the, uh, the warm-up assignment, uh, you have you've have some basic, uh, uh, you've at least logged in and, and, and uh, 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 to, to one machine. But uh, let me give you um, some uh, practical tips so that you can get started quick with other assignments. Um, I'll just mention uh, to start that we have a lot of online documentation at the ALCF uh, user site for all of our machines. And um, the, uh, that hydro example was uh, in this uh, directory under examples, but there's also some, uh, some other simple um, job script uh, to get you started uh, in that uh, directory as well. So. Um, some of you uh, have probably had uh, mixed results with your uh, crypto card. Let me just talk about some practical things so that you don't get locked out. You hopefully have noticed that what it displays is a hex string, and the letters must be typed as capitals. So if you type them as lowercase by accident, it is not going to work. Um, so. Um, uh, so suppose that you're trying to log in, and you, you type it, all caps, and like you, you think you did everything right, but it doesn't let you in. Until you actually successfully log in, the other end, the server end, doesn't advance the, in the sequence, right? Your crypto card is generating a sequence that the that the ALCF end knows what the sequence is. But it doesn't advance the window in that sequence until you actually have a, a match, right? So if you just had a typo, you can, so suppose you type it and it doesn't log you in. Just type the same one again, because if it was a typo this time, maybe you won't make the mistake and it will match and you won't get ahead of the server, right? Because if you get more than a, I'm not sure exactly what the number is, but if you, you know, get more than three or four or five ahead on your crypto card than the server is, then it will it will never match, and you'll have to resync it. So just you know, once it it pays to just type the same one again. Don't push the button; just type it again. Um, I would advise that if you are trying to log in and you fail again, just try a different. Machine like when we're all here, you could just ask somebody, "Is that machine up?" And you know, you'll you'll know. But when you're working on your own or you're in your room or something, um, if there's something goofed up with uh, one particular login, you know, trying a different. So if you're logged into, let's say Vesta, and or you're trying to log into Vesta and you can't log in, um, then you you know, have a couple of failures. Just try a different machine like Cetus and just see because that'll rule out the problems, because what you don't want to do is to have too many failed logins either on your user ID or from the IP that you're coming from um, so that uh, you don't get your account locked out um, uh, and uh, you don't get the IP uh, blocked, right? So for um, this uh, meeting, we've taken some precautions to keep you know, the, the, the IP here uh, from getting blocked, but you know, when you're coming from your own uh, user site, um, you know, that, that doesn't apply. And e suppose you're failing to log into one host, but then you log into another one, that resets your, your number of failed logins uh, to that host. So hopefully, hopefully this will help you uh, uh, stay enabled. So, um, if you've used other systems, um, you may have encountered something called modules. Modules is a package that, uh, you know, when you log in, it sets, depending on what pieces of software you want to use, uh, you put uh, some keys into a file and uh, uh, it sets up your, uh, your Unix environment for your shell the right way. Well, we use uh, something called SoftEnd, which is like modules. And, um, 
the syntax is a little different and stuff like that. But basically, um, there's a file in your home directory called dot soft, right? So you won't see it unless you say ls dash a. And um, that contains uh, keys in it that uh, will set your environment. And the simplest, uh, one, the simplest file really just contains the line at default, which just says give me all the default things. But that default does not include uh, selecting a compiler for a compiling MPI program. So you need, I'll, I'll come to this on another slide, but suppose you want the XL, the IBM XL compilers, you would say uh, wrapper, MPI wrapper XL before the default, and uh, you don't want to put things after the default. The order matters. Um, and I'll just mention that if you're using the blue genes, these are the three blue gene uh, machines that you use .soft, but Cooley is our Linux cluster and that shares a file system with Mira and Cetus. So, but it needs different, um, a different software environment. So we can't put uh, the keys in the same file. So that uses .soft .cooley. Uh, instead, just to keep it. So uh, remember that if you're trying to change the settings on Cooley, not to change them in the wrong file. And um, the other thing is that this file is read when you log in, uh, but if you change the file, right, you need to tell the system that the file's changed. So you need to type a command called resoft to refresh the environment. Um, and uh, the other thing you can do is log out and log back in again. Now, if you do type resoft, you may lose environment settings that were in your, you know, you like your bash profile or stuff like that. So just to be aware of it, because it's going to reset it from scratch. I mentioned the IBM XL compilers, but there is also, uh, you can also use the GNU compilers, and you can also use Clang. Uh, so, um, the advantage of the IBM compilers is that it's, they are, um, in general, uh, they have the, they generate the best code to take advantage of the BlueGene specific um, features, um, most notably the, the uh, floating point acceleration, right, the quad floating point unit. Um, GNU, the GNU compilers, uh, they work fine, but they do not support uh, the floating point acceleration. Clang um, does, uh, but it's only for C++. And this is a much more recent C++ implementation than the IBM one, because the IBM BlueGene compilers were branched off fairly early from the uh, Excel development um, uh, tree, and uh, they're, at this point, I think about two major versions older than what currently ships. So those are your three compilers. Um, you can, uh, with some caveats, mix and match. I mean, you do need to be careful about runtime libraries for like OpenMP uh, using two different languages with two different runtimes, so that's a potential issue. But as far as just simply calling routines in one from the other, that's not an issue, and there are no underscore issues on the blue gene. They, it's not that some compilers add underscores and more underscores than others. Uh, if you've uh, ever linked uh, uh, between C, Fortran, and different compilers, I, I think you probably know what I mean. This is a, an ex example of a very simple job script. Um, Run job is the equivalent on a blue gene of MPI run or MPI exec, right, if you're used to running on a, on a different machine. It performs the same uh, function. And this says to run uh, at uh, 16 ranks per node, I'll come back to that issue, um, with uh, 32 processes total. And it says to use the physical partition that the queue is going to set this, the queue manager, when it runs your job script, is going to set this environment variable to be the place that you were allocated to use. And then there's a colon here. This colon is actually a token that needs to have a space before and after it, okay? Make a note of that. And then your program name. And um, this line here at the top of the job script 
Uh, this is kind of like a hash PBS line. If you've used PBS, uh, it, these are options that go to um, the queue when you submit. Um, uh, in other words, I could say, Q, suppose this was, the name of this file is uh, test.sh. I could, I, I could say qsubtest.sh, and because of the, these, these options uh, are processed as if I uh, type them on the line. So this is 32 nodes for 30 minutes in this queue, right? For you, this would be dash Q training and dash A at PESC 2016. Uh, so I'll, I'll fix that in the, uh, uh, in the version that's posted online. Um, but um, uh, it's easier to uh, put these options here instead of saying Q sub dash N32 dash T30 blah, 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 every time you submit it, right? If you just put it in the file here, it will take it right out of the file when you submit it. So, um, uh, so pay attention that some arguments have single dashes like the dash P and some have double dashes like the NP and the block and uh, it's easy to do uh, typos. Um, and if you uh, forget to put this block target, uh, it won't know where to run it and uh, it will give a, an error message just saying it's confused. So, um, so this script uh, just runs one thing and then the job exits, right? When the, the script exits, the job is done and then it releases the compute nodes that you asked for. Um, just so you understand the environment that this runs in, uh, BlueGene being, a, right, we'll, we'll have a much more involved talk about the BlueGene architecture um, on uh, Monday, I think, uh, if not Monday, Tuesday. Uh, Scott Parker will be talking about it, but the Blue Gene compute nodes um, run uh, a, a very stripped down kernel with only your program in it. So they actually can't run a shell script because among other things, the compute nodes don't support uh, fork and exec. Uh, they, like I said, it's, uh, it's streamlined to just run your parallel program. So this script actually on the Blue Gene, this runs on a login node, um, but while it's running, you have uh, the nodes here, the 32 nodes allocated for you. And um, uh, then uh, when you actually launch this is when, with the run job, is when you, um, you, you start the execution on the compute nodes. Let's see. Um, so like any queuing system, you'll get the output in a file and uh, it will be by default, uh, suppose your job number is uh, 123, it'll come out as 123.output, 123.error, 123.cobalt log, and you can change that with an option if you want to name it something different. Um, and um, environment variables have to be actually passed on this run job line specifically. You need to stick a dash dash n. So there's a man on run job you can, uh, look for more examples. Cooley, the um, is more like a Linux cluster kind of environment. The version of Cobalt that runs on that, Cobalt the scheduler, is a little bit different um, because of the different environment. And uh, there the script does actually run on the head node of the set of nodes that you're allocated. Um, and uh, it takes a slightly different form. Um, the uh, names of the nodes that you're given are, are put into this file, and so this simple script uh, just uh, counts uh, uh, the number of nodes that were given, and uh, there are 12, uh, you can run 12 processes, it's uh, 12 processes per node, and uh, here you use MPI run, uh, uh, you know, rather than run job, and uh, so forth, and uh, you would uh, submit, uh, um, submit it like this. I believe in the, uh, this is the cluster version of Cobalt. I think that you can stick those into the script uh, with a hash Cobalt also. Uh, but uh, I don't use this machine enough to uh, uh, know for sure off the top of my head. 
As I mentioned, uh, you uh, would submit your job with QSUB, and uh, this one does have the correct uh, project name is at PES 2016 and Q training. Uh, this would submit for 10 minutes on 32 nodes, uh, and uh, uh, you can, if you, you tell it mode script, then it will uh, interpret your, your, jo your script uh, job file. Um, if your uh, job script actually has one of those hash cobalt lines on the top, uh, it will see that and know that it's a script, so you don't actually have to say mode script, but it doesn't hurt. Before you submit it, you need to make sure that uh, it's executable, right? So you have to do a chmod plus x on that. Otherwise, it's going to say, I don't know how to execute it. And um, uh, for um, this class, we, are, we have set up a special queue called training. Uh, I, I think that's, uh, it's also detailed on the next slide. But um, so if you, uh, for other, for non-reserved uh, use of the machine, you know, in other words, if you want to access uh, the part of the machine that's not uh, reserved just for this, for at PESC, um, you would generally submit to the default queue. Um, you can say dash queue default, or you can just leave off the queue name. Uh, it doesn't matter. Um, and uh, if you get tired of typing the project name, uh, which, you know, dash a at pesk, you can set an environment variable. If you set cobalt proj, cobalt underscore proj to, let's say, at pesk 2016, then it will just use that by default whenever you submit. After you submit, you want to check and see what it's doing, whether it's running or not. You use qstat. You can limit the output of qstat to your jobs if you say dash u with your username. Uh, maybe a little easier than using grep. Uh, if you say qstat and the, the number of the job ID, it will, it will tell you just that particular job. And if you need a more detailed listing uh, with all of the job properties, fl will give you that. And if you want to kill it, qdel. And um, so let's say you uh, do a qstat and you don't know why it's not running or you decide you can uh, see um, what reservations are currently set in the machine. So I'll talk about this a little bit more, what's been set aside and what hasn't for at PESC. But some, some uh, parts of the machine have been uh, set aside for at PESC at certain times of the day and whatnot. And the way you would see uh, that is to look at show res. Okay, so show reservations. So previously, I talked about how do you submit a job script that's completely non-interactive, right? When the resources are available, it'll run it. And then um, uh, when it's done, you look at the uh, output file. But uh, when you're trying to debug something, it's helpful to basically get a command prompt. And um, you can do it with what's called an interactive job. So suppose. I, uh, I say dash capital I here, which is interactive, and uh, I want 32 nodes and 30 minutes. Um, oh, here's another one I missed. Uh, so this should be Q training and at PESC 2016. Um, I apologize for that. Um, so when you submit, um, what happens is your request goes into the queue, but you haven't actually specified anything to run. And when those 32 nodes are available for 30 minutes, what happens is it will give you a shell prompt. So at that point on the blue gene, um, it may not be quite ready to run yet. You, you have to run a command called wait boot and that will just check the status of the partition because there's sometimes a little bit of a lag, um, right? This is not an issue when you submit a non-interactive job because before it runs your job script, it will wait for the partition to finish booting. But there's, uh, there's something a little difficult in the uh, flow of system control that um, uh, you need to, when you're running interactively, just type wait boot and it will just, it will tell you, you it may only take about 15, 20 seconds um, 
to uh, finish booting the partition before it's ready to run. Then you can run a run job and you use the same exact syntax to run that you did in the script job, right? So you can do that when that's done or if you need to control C it, whatever, you could just run another one and run another one, run whatever you want to do. At some point, you're gonna run out of time, right? Because you, you let's say you ask for 30 minutes here. Uh, you, when you get to 30 minutes, what happens? Well, the shell's not gonna go away. It's still gonna be there, but when you launch another run job, um, it will just fail with some kind of error message. So you need to kind of pay attention. Um, and the easiest way, if you don't know what's going on, is to say qstat and cobalt job ID, right? And the, in your shell, this will be set to the job ID of the job that you're running. Uh, and so if that output shows your job, then your job is still, you know, you can see what state it's in. It should say running. Um, but if that output shows nothing, it means your job ended and it went away, right? So if it says nothing, then you need to, there's nothing you can do. You need to just exit that shell and submit another job. What is it that you have access to? The primary resource, for small things at least, that you should use is Vesta, right? Vesta is a two-rack blue gene, and um, uh, Adam was fine-tuning some of this. Adam Scoville is the, the lead blue gene system admin. Um, he, um, I think actually tonight, uh, the queue called training is actually mapped to the entire machine and not just 1K, but um, the, the general intent was that for pretty much everything, you should be able to submit to training uh, and uh, it, it should run. And for the evening sessions, at least, the, about half of the machine, one rack, is devoted to at pesk run. So you should get quick turnaround. So you shouldn't you know, try to run something like huge and you know, for hours at a time, because while well, there are some limits on it, but um, you, know, you, you all need to run. So Vesta is different from the other BlueGene machines is that the smallest hardware partition is 32 nodes. So you can't, if you ask for less than 32 nodes, you're still gonna get 32 nodes, okay? But if you ask for more, you'll either get 64, 128, 256, and so on. They're, they're basically um, powers of two on that machine. Later on, uh, you know, when you get going, you might have uh, bigger stuff to run. Uh, that won't fit on Vesta, and um, <clears throat> you'll need to move over to Mira and Cetus. And uh, you know, Mira is the main machine, and we also have a queue set up um, uh, called Training over there. And every night there'll be a reservation for it for 8K nodes. But on Mira, the smallest job that you can possibly run is 512 nodes, right? If you ask for one node, you're gonna get 512. So that's why when you're running small tests, you know, you wanna use something else. Now, Mira and Cetus are on one file system along with Cooley, and um, Vesta is on a separate. So Vesta is the one that's on a different file system by itself, and Mira, Cetus, Cooley are on another. So you know you may have to rsync your files across, but CDIS you could consider as sort of like the um, uh, the debug queue for Mira, right? It's CDIS and Mira are have exactly the same system software compilers and everything. I, I mean, at this moment, Vesta is on exactly the same level as well, so that's not so much an issue. But Vesta and Mira are always guaranteed to be the same in terms of software. And uh, CDIS, you can run things down to 128 nodes is the smallest partition. So, um, uh, whereas, you know, like I said, Vesta is 32. If you're only running little tests, use Vesta. When you're ready to go bigger, you know, debug your mirror setup on CDIS and uh, then run it, you know, on mirror. And so, basically, the training queue is good for almost all the time, and if um, that's not, uh, depending on what time of day or so forth, if things are not starting there, you're welcome to submit to the default queue. The default is where everybody is, all of our users, so you know, there's, just bear in mind that there's contention there. And then when you registered, you were also given uh, tokens and information for NERSC and OLCF, the other two 
DOE supercomputing sites. On OLCF, you'll use this queue named TRN001, I guess that's short for training, and uh, NERSC just used the regular queues, and uh, you got uh, some handouts in your registration packet with more information, so. Yeah, I touched on this uh, already. The minimum partition sizes on the blue gene are Vesta 32 nodes, CETAS 128, and Mira 512. So the blue gene architecture, you know, uh, the uh, compute node partitions actually have uh, specific wiring to wrap around to make the toruses, and that's why you can't just take an arbitrary number of nodes and uh, make them into a compute partition, right? So that, that's the, the, the origin of the size constraints. There, there's a, there is actually um, hardware wiring involved with the uh, setup. And generally, the partitions are, um, like I said, powers of two. But on Mira, because it's larger, there are some non-powers of two, power of two sizes. Uh, for example, uh, 12K and 24K. Um, that don't fit that pattern, but uh, pretty much all the other uh, powers of two are. And uh, the other thing I just wanted to mention was that uh, on BlueGene, you make your queue request by the number of nodes, but a node right, has 16 cores on it, but it can be configured when it's booted to run a in a variety of different modes. And a mode means how many MPI processes are put onto that node, right? You could put anywhere from one MPI process up to 64. Okay, that's called the mode. So the sort of, if you don't know what else to do, I would recommend using 16, because that, that, what that does is 16 divides the memory on the node into 16 pieces and gives each core one of those pieces, you get one MPI process per core. Now, a core can actually run up to four threads, uh, so if you're using OpenMP, you might want to adjust that up or down. Um, but, uh, you know, so one extreme of that is to put only one MPI process on that whole node, and it has uh, 16 cores or 64 threads worth of resources available for that one process, right, as opposed to having more processes, or process is the same thing as rank, right? <clears throat> so, um, I know that can be a little confusing because most uh, architectures are not um, configured that way. Um, so um, start with 16, and uh, if you have other needs, uh, you can uh, adjust it up or down. So as I was saying, OpenMP is supported. Uh, P-threads are supported too, but it's more likely that you're going to use OpenMP. And um, at least with the XL compilers, um, you want to make sure that you use the thread safe version of the compiler, right? So MPI XLC, just MPI XLC, is the wrapper for uh, the XLC compiler, but it's not the thread safe version. If you want to, if your, pro, your program is going to do threading, um, you want to use the version that's underscore R. Right, so for whatever it is, MPI XLF90 underscore R, right, all the compilers from IBM that, uh, um, if you want the thread safe version, it's not an option on the argument list, it's part of the compiler name. And um, something you should, right, to turn it on, that you want to process um, OpenMP directives, you need to say QSMP equals OMP. Now, as soon as you specify QSMP, the Excel compilers will automatically also do automatic um, simdization, right? And if you only want it to do uh, simd things where you have OpenMP directives, you need to disable that default with no auto, right? And in addition to that, uh, if you're debugging and using a debugger, you should be aware that um, the process, uh, the, when the compiler processes the loops to do uh, the OpenMP, um, it will also, it does that after an optimization step. So even if you say dash O zero, in the loops, it will still optimize, 
but you can inhibit that if you say no opt. So that's another. Uh, so, so when you're debugging, you may step through uh, an OpenMP loop or something like that and find that it's jumping all over the place because the code was, uh, the optimization step um, uh, rearranged, did code rearrangement. And that's not normally what you would expect with dash O zero. Um, the environment uh, variable, right, which is standard uh, to set the number of threads in your execution is OMP num threads, but you can't just say export OMP num threads equals eight and expect it to work, right? Like I mentioned before, uh, to pass it to the compute node program, uh, any environment variable, you need to use the ENVS dash dash ENVS uh, option on it, right? So, and then uh, the thread stack size is uh, uh, a fixed default value. So if you find that your program works for some cases and not for others, it may be because you're overrunning the OpenMP stack, so you can uh, set it to whatever you want with this other environment variable, right, which you'd also set using n. So here's a complete example of uh, how you would run something. That's about it for hopefully the tips that will get you started. And so um, I just wanted to open the floor up to any questions. Uh, if you had any problems with the uh, warm-up assignment or uh, any questions about uh, what I presented, uh, feel free to, uh, to ask. Mm -hmm. I had a question. I, I didn't have any problem with the assignment, but uh, do you, when, you, when you log on and you're in your home directory, is that the appropriate place to run things? Um, that's fine. Um, if you have a program that um, writes a lot of a large volume of data, I mean, there's things will work okay in your home, and. Uh, but the home file system doesn't have the same bandwidth as the slash projects, um, the, the file system that slash projects is on. So if you are doing um, something big, you could create yourself a subdirectory in uh, projects at PESC uh, 2016, create yourself a subdirectory right there. So like if you're definitely, if you're benchmarking any IO, you'd want to do it there. Because the file system is striped over a much larger number of servers, and I don't remember off the top of my head, but on our um, uh, web documentation, it, it tells you the, uh, the number of uh, NSDs that are. Um, but if you're creating a lot of output, it's still okay to put it in the home? Define a lot. You know, if it's a terabyte, then. <laughs> where I'm at, where I'm at, you know, we have a different space for when you're, when you're actually creating a lot of data. And I was just curious. Yeah, so your home file, your home directory does have a quota um, that's not huge. Uh, I, I think it might be 10 gig or something like that. Okay, and the pro, you, you, the, for when uh, the, 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 the normal method is that everybody associated with a research project gets a, a, a project, like, like you are associated with AtPesk they get a directory in, um, in projects to put their stuff in, and uh, it's usually the quota is much larger. But on the other hand, that file system's not backed up. <laughs> so, the, so generally, we intend for large users that you keep your source code in your home and build it, but you should run it out of projects. To get in the training queue, uh, let's say that's a mirror, which production which have so the queue that you submit to and the project that you build, so the project is just the uh, the pot of hours that you're that you're allocated to use, and the only one for this for AtPesk is AtPesk 2016. So you how do we get on the trend queue? Is there a flag? That yeah, you say dash when you do the queue sub, you do queue sub dash queue training. Or put it into the job script, you know, hash cobalt dash q training. Yeah, so all of you should be enabled to use uh, that q, and uh, if for some reason uh, not, uh, then just let one of us know. <laughs>